Yes, we are. We are Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. He's D Gun. I am Rob Ellis. We're hanging out with you on this Friday. Let's talk some football, baby. Let's bring in our next guest, Dave Zingaro. Dave covers the birds for NBC Sports Philadelphia. You can follow him on Twitter at D Zengaro NBCS. Also does an awesome podcast with our buddy Ruben Frank called Eagle Eye. What's happening, Dave? Hey guys, what's going on? What's going Dave, on, first, man? first question. Um, I know you guys were there yesterday. Um, I, I refresh my memory if this was the case last year too. Is, is this the way it usually is? You you get a taste of the first one and then you're not there for the second one, or was this new? Why isn't the media there or have access today? Yeah, the, so they used to do. I mean, back in the day, it was like every day you'd be at absolutely. OTAs. Yeah, you have to watch every practice. Uh, the letter of the law says that they only have to open up. A portion of them so the eagles have six sessions are going to open up two of them uh they actually started on uh tuesday so they went tuesday this week uh thursday friday so yesterday was our day there and then they'll have three sessions next week and reporters will be there for one of them okay okay yeah we weren't sure we were trying to remember how it went down last year if that was the same way or not it was the same way last year it didn't used to be that way it kills right. me a little bit i like watching I was gonna say, they're gonna kill you guys man yeah okay okay well, well, let, well let's just go back to yesterday then just I, i'm not talking about hey this is this means he's going to be a starter i mean just what stood out to you i heard a lot of people saying they thought nolan smith looked bigger mm -hmm. than what was sort of sold to, that, that he's just totally undersized and all that but he, he kind of looked you know, like a bigger dude. What was that? One of your impressions? Yeah, he looked the part, and uh, that—that's the thing. It's like it, when you're only watching one third of the practices, you can't really get too carried away with like what actually mm -hmm. happens when they're in like seven on sevens. Like you, you say what happens, but it's not—you don't want to take any generalizations away from it. So there are some things you get from it, and one of them is like just being around the players. You get a sense of their size and. Uh, it sounds kind of goofy, but it matters because, like, you watch them on tape or you watch them on TV, and they're just like, "Yeah, it's it's tough to tell." When you get it in person, like seeing Nolan Smith, yeah, he looks—I wouldn't say he's like a big guy, but he doesn't look super slender, like you were kind of worried about a little bit when you have a, a two hundred and what thirty-five pound edge rusher. He looks the part. Um, I thought that with Jalen Carter when uh, when they brought him in for press conferences, that was easy to see. Like this guy is. Uh, he's got the size you want. He's a big guy. Lower half is big. Mm -hmm. um, and then like depth chart stuff. And it's not to say the depth chart won't change, but you get to see a little bit of it. So you see, all right, Cam Jurgens is getting the first crack at right guard. The linebackers are what we expected. Nicobe Dean at the mic, uh, Nick Morrow at the will. Nicobe has the green dot. That's a really important part of this defense. The safeties, Edmonds and Reed Blankenship back there. I think eventually we'll see Sidney Brown work in, but he's a rookie. So uh, Blankenship and, and Edmonds are the first two out there. Uh, so I, like little things like that are what you kind of gain from these OTA practices. Dave, I said yesterday when we, we, we saw uh, Twitter reports coming down that Blankenship and Edmonds lined up as the two safeties. I said, I believe going in, Blankenship has the distinct advantage only because of his experience over Sidney Brown, but he is going to have to fight to maintain. If Sidney Brown is what we think he is, he's going to have to, Blankenship is going to have to really fight to, to hold that position. And then that's not a knock against Blankenship, but I just think Sidney Brown, and again, it's based on college, just has more versatility, a little bit quicker, better lateral speed. I think eventually Sidney will be the starter, but I think Reed has earned that right to hold him off until further notice. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting when you talk about positions at safety because yeah. it, it, we think they're going to be a little interchangeable. But uh, honestly, when I look at it, I think uh, Edmonds and Sidney Brown are, are a little redundant. Um, okay. Just because I think they're better closer to the line of scrimmage, uh, whereas Blankenship to me is more of a free safety. Mm -hmm. uh, not that it, it matters all the time because these guys are going to move around a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the Eagles have talked about Sidney Brown being able to play in the post, and he did that a little bit in college. He showed at the senior bowl to them, which was important. That was part of their evaluation. Uh, but early on, like to me, he's a guy I would want close to the line, close to the action, whereas you know, I think that's kind of what Edmonds is too. So I'm also yeah. curious to see if they utilize some – 
three safety sets. This guy's done that in his past. And with the guy like Edmonds, who has like he's a veteran, he's been in the league a long time. You can kind of play him in the box like a linebacker. Yep. And when you look at their linebackers, you go, well, if it's between Edmonds or, or Nick Morrow out there, in certain situations, you might want Edmonds out there. So I could see them running some three safety packages okay. and utilizing his skill set like that. But I, I think Reed's going to have a really good shot to start this year. I, I agree. How are they lining up interior D line, Dave? How, how did that look yesterday? At least well, that's tough one. because most of the, the competitive work they did was uh, seven on sevens. Wow. So it, you can't even really get a sense of it. And it just from like a, a spacing on the field standpoint, the defensive line is so far away. Mm. Uh, it's almost impossible to watch them. So I don't have a good sense of that yet. I, I And they're allowed to do 11 on 11s in OTAs and the Eagles won't. I, they're, they're just so um, so conscious of keeping these guys off their feet and right. having easy practices. I don't think we'll see 11 on 11s. And even if we did, like I don't know how much we can really take away from these non-padded practices. But that's something to watch, uh, certainly, you know, because uh, to me, the, the, the fascinating thing there is Jordan Davis is like their only prototypical nose tackle. Right. But they have other guys who can – play the zero but uh he's he's like the guy and last year he was really rotating with Linval joseph even when jordan came back like that was a healthy rotation they don't really have that guy maybe it's marlon toy Peloto. he was injured he didn't practice yesterday uh noah ellis a guy who was uh, christian ellis's brother the linebacker noah ellis was hurt all last year so we didn't get to see him in spring he was he's an intriguing prospect from idaho um so maybe he has a chance, like he's probably like a sneaky guy to make the roster. If not, they're going to have to kind of piece that position together when it comes to depth. Hmm. Dave, it, it's still way, way too early to tell, but just in your preliminary, looking at the roster, looking at the talent, looking at the depth, and we know how he does not like to stand pat in any way, shape or form. If you pick, if you could pick one position. Linebacker. That, I was gonna say, yeah, you knew where I was going. You knew where you, I was going. You two worked it. together for too long. Yeah, we did. My goodness, yeah. he knew exactly what I was getting at. Yeah, it's linebacker. It's yeah, um, and it's not just even about the starters. Uh, you know, yeah. like we knew Nicobe Dean was probably going to be a starter this year. Nick Morrow, yeah, he started in the league, but I, he's a limited player. It, like former safety, I, I think he can have a decent season. But I think it's notable that Chicago went out and signed two linebackers this offseason uh, to upgrade that spot. And then after that, I mean, we're talking about Davion Taylor, who once upon a time we all thought had some promise. And but like he's a weird he's in a weird position because I think the only way he gets better is to play him. And you're not going to play him on a team with Super Bowl aspirations. You have Sean Bradley, who, you know, even when their linebackers were awful, didn't get a chance to play defense. Christian Ellis is the one that like, all right, it, he's shown a little bit in a very small sample size that he can play, but you're not feeling great if he has to really get in there and take mm. significant reps. So uh, that's the one spot I, I think it, it kind of similar to safety last year where they went out and got CJ Garner Johnson yep. right before the season started. I think there's a real chance we get the training camp and we take a look at these guys on, on grass and go, eh, Linebacker, even even with how little the Eagles care about that position, it's the one I look at and go, I don't know if that's going to be good enough, especially for a team that, you know, had this, this is a Super Bowl team, and and I don't know if they can go into a season with what they have. Yeah, and and that is that is how he's mo a lot, Dave, and that's fine. I like that he he does that. You know, he'll he'll get a look at camp, get some input from the coaches, look at what's going on out there, and if it's not up to speed, he'll he'll do something. I you know. I, it's these guys aren't just, you know, you can't pluck them from the linebacker tree. It, it, it's hard to find them, but still, I mean, if, if it looks ugly, I think he will upgrade. That's, that's going to be the part of the challenge for Sean Desai. I mean, you got two new starting linebackers. One is a, is a, you know, a kid in a Kobe Dean, um, you know, and, and safety it's two, you know, a, one that's a, a second year player and a new player to the system. This is, it's going to take a minute here for this defense. Like I think there's a ton of talent and I still think they're going to be really good at getting to the quarterback, but there's, there's some issues here that you gotta you gotta at least early concern yourself with. 
Yeah, and it's kind of crazy because all the players they lost for the most part on defense are right down the middle of the field. You, yep. lo- you lose yep. your best defensive tackle. You lose both linebackers and you lose both safeties. It's <laughs> That's a little troubling. And in, it might have come together slowly anyway with the new DC. And now you have all these new pieces. Um, they might be a little behind. I, I think that's natural. Um, and I don't know if overall they had the same level of talent that they had last year. It was tough to duplicate that. So uh, I think they did a good job replenishing. You get Jalen Carter in the first round. You get Nolan Smith. I mean, that you're loading up in the trenches, and that's a good thing. Uh, I think N'Kobe Dean, I'm still bullish on, even though he didn't play last year. Uh, I still think he has a chance to be really good. He's going to have a lot on his plate, though. Uh, a lot to prove. And and that green dot means a lot. I mean, that's it's an important part of a defense with all those new pieces and a new system. You're putting a lot on N'Kobe Dean's shoulders. Uh, and I, th- I think he's up to it, but you never really know. Yeah. If there was one area on this defense that was consistently vulnerable, it was defending the middle of the field in the passing game. And you study this stuff. I love looking at a lot of your perspectives and stories that you write. For the life of me, and I've covered this team for over 25 years. Now, back in the day when I initially covered it, the linebacking position was a prime position. When you had the Trotters and Carlos Emmons and players like that. But but lately, they don't emphasize – the linebacking position whatsoever. Dave, why? Why did they totally neglect the linebacking position? Yeah, I don't think it's like a negative about the linebacker position. I think it's more of an emphasis on other spots. You know, they, they look at the front, obviously, is something that they're always going to put resources into. But even on the back end, cornerback is a premium position. They're not alone in that. Like, cornerback is – around the league, a more premium position than safety and linebacker. Mm-hmm. And for good reason. I mean, you look at some of these offenses and some of these receivers in the league and you think we got to try to find a way to at least slow these guys down. So uh, I don't think it's like they look at the linebacker position and think, man, it's not important. I think they look at it and think it's not as important as the line. It's not as important as the corners. And then it, it kind of trickles down from there. And you, you mentioned some of like the Trotters and the Emmons, like it's amazing just to see the way the league is gone because like you have uh, mm-hmm. safeties are now linebackers, linebackers yep. are now edge players. Like everything's getting smaller uh, because offenses are getting faster and mm-hmm. you're just trying to combat that as best you can. And it sometimes the converted safeties work. It, it, it changes your perspective, though. Like, Nick Morrow is a converted safety. Kaiser White, converted safety. Going back to Nate Gary, converted safety. It's commonplace now, and it, you're, all you're trying to do is find some guys with coverage skills that are big enough to not completely be liabilities in the run game. Mm. Dave, go to the other side here. Um, what area do you want to see Jalen Hurts improve upon? <laughs> um, it's a good question. He it he was so good last year. It, it's not. I don't think there's anything glaring. Um, I think it's just natural progression as a quarterback in this league. You want him to understand defenses better. I'm not saying he didn't do it well last year, but I think that's always an area where uh, it's like natural. The quarterbacks are going to get better at it the more they see. Um, so I think that's like the he's at that point though, where it's you know a couple years ago we're like accuracy, got to get better accuracy. Throwing with anticipation, uh, throwing with anticipation to me was the biggest one. When we were talking a year ago, right now, I'd say that's where he has to get better. He can't throw to open guys; he has to throw guys open. And then last year, he was great at that, and he really had an understanding of his receivers, and especially like AJ Brown and Devontae, just trusting those guys, throwing to them when they're not open. So uh, you want to continue that? You want to keep it going? Uh, I think you, you want him to understand defenses better, which is just like a natural progression for quarterbacks. And as much as I, I, I'd like to see him take the easy play, he did that at times last year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if there's a check down, take it. He's gotten better with that. I think the competitor in him still takes over at times and it, it makes us all hold our breath. Uh, but I live with that if if I'm the Eagles in a way because that's what makes him special. But uh, limiting those hits and making sure 
that he he continues to do that. Dave, I said last week I expect Dan Arnold to emerge as the number two tight end in, in this offense, based on Calcaterra and Stoll being bits and pieces. You know, not Ar- Arnold has that that veteran experience. You know, Calcaterra and Stoll give you one or the other. They don't give you both. Neither one gives you both in terms of pass block. I mean, uh, pass catching block. Do you agree or disagree that Arnold could be your number two when it's all said and done? I don't know if Arnold's giving you a lot in the blocking department. You don't think so? I think no. it's better than what they have. Yeah, he's a, he's he's big enough, but yeah. like you look at his career, he has not been known for his blocking. He's been like a, a big receiver out there. It's interesting because like tight end was a position to me where I thought I would try to upgrade that yeah. and with with a mid round pick, and I know that they didn't have a ton of them. Because uh, this was a really good tight end class, I thought there would be guys available in the third, fourth round. Even though they didn't have a ton of picks in the middle of this draft, I thought that was a spot where maybe they'd try to improve. I think they view it differently than you and I do, though. Like I, okay. I think when they look at Jack Stoll, they see a guy who just plays his role, right. and like I don't know how much pass catching ability they want out of their second tight end because they look at it like. If he's out there, he's probably going to be blocking, and we're not going to try to get the ball to Jack Stoll mm-hmm. when we have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard and whoever else. I mean, there are obviously options ahead of him. I thought like getting a young tight end to, to match with Goddard would give that 12 personnel package some some teeth, and they clearly didn't think that was worthwhile. So uh, maybe Dan Arnold has a shot. Uh, he is a veteran, so like I expect him to look pretty good in training camp. He did have a nice catch uh, yesterday when we were out there. Uh, when we were talking about body types, though, Grand Calcaterra, I want to ask him about it. It looked a little bigger to me. Okay. okay. Uh, which was important. Uh, he needed to, to put on a little bit of weight. He looked bigger to me. Uh, curious to see just, like, if, if, he, if he'll tell us how much he has put on. He see, always looked like reason- a receiver to me, uh, Calcaterra. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Gunny. Yeah. yeah, but the reason I asked you that question, Dave, is because when Goddard was out for the extended period of time, the tight end position in the passing game suffered. You know, it it, it it was almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the, look at the better offenses that l- like to use a lot of 12 personnel, you have that dual option to go to one side of the field or the other to keep the defense off balance. And and the lack of Dallas Goddard in that offense really handcuffed it. I, I shouldn't say handcuffed because the offense was still explosive. But it took away another element of that offense to keep that defense on its heels. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if Dan Arnold's the answer. Um, I, I, look, he's a good pass catcher, but I, I think yeah. he he would be a little – like if you're saying he's going to be your guy in 12 personnel with Dallas Goddard, I don't know if he gives you what Jack Stoll gives you as a blocker. Okay. Like maybe he's a good option if Goddard gets hurt, but I don't know if you can keep him around for that. I agree with you, though, because like when they lost Goddard, you're, now you're like, man – Jack Stoll's the tight end one. That's not that's not ideal. Right. You want someone with a little more ability to pass catch. Uh, I think Arnold is a little redundant with Calcaterra, honestly, in my opinion. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not giving him enough credit as a blocker, but uh, to me, he's just a, he's a big receiver. Dave, how about the running backs? Will this be hot hand? Will this be a matchup thing? Uh, is one going to be designated the starter and then, you know, kind of mix and match? How, how do you see it with – I guess I'm referring specifically to Penny and, and and Swift, but you could certainly work in the other two as well. But how do you see it? Yeah, I, I don't know how it's going to go. That's the one position where I'm like, I really want to see what it looks like in training camp in terms of divvying it up because – um I, if I had to pick one guy who I think is going to have the most touches, I would go with Swift mm. because of his ability out of the backfield. He's a solid runner, home run threat. Penny, to me, like is is very productive, but if you want to try to keep him healthy, I, I don't think he can be a workhorse. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're just set, like he might not stay healthy either way, but you're setting yourself up for disaster if you're going into a season relying on him to be the, the top running back. And Gainwell is kind of a, an unknown too, a little bit. Like he had a great playoff run, but I thought a lot of his season was kind of underwhelming, to be honest. Like I, it, they don't have a clear number one, and that's okay. But I, I don't really know what what it's going to look like. And uh, I think Boston's still a nice option to have if one of those guys gets hurt. 
because I feel like he can kind of carry a load for a game, especially if they're playing the Giants. Right. Uh, so if you keep him around for that, I'm fine with it. As far as the other ones go, I, I'd maybe put Swift at the top of the depth chart, but it might be ride the hot hand. And, and if like Penny looks like the Penny of old and he's that productive, I think it's going to take some discipline to not use him too much. I'm glad I'm glad you broke him down like this. So I have to put you on the spot. Which of the backs do you like the best? Just your personal preference. Which of them do you like the best? Um, <laughs> Penny. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and, and that's with the, the biggest caveat in the world because the guy can't stay healthy. He, I mean, he's a, a pro bowl, all pro talent. And he's yeah. like, and, and it's not just like projection. He's been that good in the league. It's just, you don't get him for, for more than, you know, eight games. And that's, yeah. Yeah. it's just tough to like, I don't know how you can go into a season relying on him. And that's what makes it so tough because like when you watch him play, like he did that in Seattle the thought of him running behind this line in Philly, you're thinking he's going to average seven yards a carry here, but yeah, yeah. He, I just, I don't know if he's going to be able to stay healthy. And I don't think they know. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, and if you had to put money on it, you'd say he's going to get hurt right. at some point because it's, it's, it's he's done it his entire career. Yeah. Dave, third receiver spot. Is it Quez? Is it uh, mm-hmm. Alameda? Uh, how, how do you, how do you view that, uh, that position? I think Quez is going to have every opportunity to, to keep it. Uh, it, it, the nice thing is honestly that they're different enough that if they're both on the team, they can probably find ways to use them both. Um, but Quez just has speed, and I, I he had an awful year last year, just a disaster, and um, like not even just bad plays, but plays that cost them games. Yeah, you know it was it was tough to watch, but the speed element is special and i'm not saying that there aren't guys in the league who have speed but he's proven he can be a deep threat i mean he has a bunch of four yard catches and the way i look at it is this offense is going to run through three guys right we already know this the pass offense they they don't try to hide it's going to run through aj brown it's going to run through Devontae smith it's going to run through dallas goddard so after that i don't want a possession guy as a slot if i'm them i want a guy who can catch three balls a game and make a major impact. And the way I think you do that is with a guy who has some speed, who can catch a seam ball, who can take it to the house. And it's funny, you look at Quez's numbers from last year, and I almost throw like the yards per target, yards per catch are so low, but there were so many of those like weird dump off plays where they were trying to get him the ball yeah. close to the line of scrimmage. Like, That's not how you should be using Quez Watkins. So like, I don't care about that. I care about him being a vertical threat and not even catching the ball, just stretching the defense. That's an element that matters. I like Alame Zacchaeus. He's improved every year he's been in the league, but he doesn't have that one thing that makes him special. Quez has that. Now, how do they feel about him after last year? Mm. You know, I I think that's fair to question. It was a terrible year, but – uh, he had 647 receiving yards a couple years ago. He was their number two receiver. Uh, if he can just be steady and not make mistakes, I, I think he's still the leader to be the third receiver. Okay. Wow. Yep. Interesting. Dave, what are you, uh, you, 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 you going to do with all your free time in June? There's no mandatory mini camp. We asked this to uh, Jeff McLean yesterday. And I know how you writers, you know, you like to get in there and, 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 and get stuff in, in there and get your, you know, sometimes the one-on-ones when the PR staff will make you guys available occasionally. What the heck are you going to do the whole month of June? It's a long layoff, too. It's because we're, we're yeah. sort of done so early. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like, oh, it's over a month and a half. Uh, I'll probably work on um, a few features here and there. Uh, we'll do our, we do like some countdowns. We always work with uh, TV side of things to do a, a top 25 most important countdown. Well, I'll take some vacation time because I have all this vacation time and I have like a month to use it <laughs> in the year where there's <laughs> nothing going on. So I'll probably get out of the office a little bit. Where are we going, Dave? It's always something exotic. I know that. Where, where no, are we nothing going? crazy this year. Headed to uh, flying with a buddy to Vancouver and then meeting some other friends and we're going to 
uh, take a little ferry across the Vancouver Island for a few days, uh, then spend some time in, in Washington State, which is I, I like it out there. I was there last year. Nothing, nothing crazy on the schedule this season. That, that is that if that's tame by your standards, you usually, it is. Yeah, you know, it should be fun. Though. No, or no something. wrestling crocodiles or swimming down swimming down the Nile. No, uh, you know what? I I do want to. Um, it's funny. I've been trying to convince my friends to do this, but there's a. It's not super expensive. It's a little boat ride. Because uh, on Vancouver Island, like the bears really get into the seafood, like yeah. so in low tide, all the crustaceans are like visible. So they'll go out and, and munch on on you know scallops and mm. mussels or whatever. So the boat ride takes you to the shore where they know they'll be, so you can go spot bears from the from the water, which is a, a good way to spot a bear when mm-hmm. you're on a boat and able to leave pretty quick. Yeah, right. well, not only that, don't forget bears can swim. So be yeah, careful. Like, listen, don't be one of those guys, man, where you're like, hey, you know, don't poke the bear, Dave. Okay. <laughs> don't poke the bear. We, we like having you on the show. Um we have, I, we have to announce that Dave Zangaro is no longer with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, last one, Dave, because I, I like to hit people with this. If you take Dallas and San Fran out, who would be your next in in the NFC? If you exclude those two. Along with the Eagles, obviously. Who, who would be after that for your pecking order? Um, oof. That's a tough one. It is tough. It, it might be the Giants. Mm. Mm. I, I don't buy Minnesota. I mean, you can throw Minnesota in there. Mm-hmm. I don't buy any of the teams in the South. I think New Orleans would be better with Derek mm-hmm. Carr. I like Derek Carr a lot. Mm-hmm. I think they have it. I think I would pick them to win the NFC South, but I still think that division is pretty weak. I think the Bears will be better, but I don't think they're going to be a great team. I think Fields will be pretty good. Uh, How about Detroit? Yeah, Detroit's a sexy pick. Um, I want to see it. It was a great stretch last year. Let's see if they can do it for an entire year. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they have definitely have the potential. I was kind of going through divisions. Uh, in my head, I, I I think they're probably right in the mix in the second tier. But I like that you included Dallas with the Eagles and 49ers because I see so much about the Eagles and 49ers being the two best teams in the NFC. But I'm like, Dallas was I, I know that they've struggled in the playoffs in, in recent years, but they were right there with the Eagles all last year. Yep. And uh, I I think those three teams deserve to be in the same group before the rest of the NFC. Yeah, and and have had a lot of success mm-hmm. against the Eagles too. Mm-hmm. On yeah. top of that, and and so is Dak. Um, all right, good Dave, good stuff, man. Uh, enjoy a little uh, little vacay, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll chat with you as we get closer. Derek's worried about you, so be careful out there. All right? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, man. <laughs> be good, Dave. Thanks for hanging out with all us, right, man. Guys, all right, Dave. Care. Take care. It's Dave Zingaro, NBC Sports, Philadelphia. And, of course, uh, check him out on Twitter as well. You get get links to all of his work at D Zingaro, NBCS. And, of course, the Eagle Eye podcast with uh, with Ruben Frank as well. Yeah, you know, Derek, you could pass those, the Eagles, Niners, and Cowboys. I think it's really up for grabs. Like, are are we disrespecting Seattle a little bit, not fully buying into them? I wonder sometimes, you know, when 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 you think about it a little bit, I, I think Seattle is a definitive sleeper. Yeah. Um, I think Geno shocked the world, and he's got another year in the system. They spent money on defense. You know, they 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 were a team that was expected to finish at the bottom of the division. They emerged as a playoff team. Right. You know, with a, with a porous defense. So now that they spent some money to fix the defense and added an offensive pass-catching weapon, yeah, I expect Seattle to be in the mix. Detroit, like Dave said, is a sexy pick. And uh, that's a team I've told you for weeks I'm going to be closely watching. Now, I will say this about Minnesota. Dave is right. For the most part, I don't buy Minnesota. But they added a, another receiver, and they have Brian Flores now coaching yeah. their defense instead of Ed Donatel. You know how I felt about Ed Donatel. It's a massive upgrade. Yeah, Brian Brian Flores is a huge upgrade over Ed Donatel. So I think you have to consider Minnesota as well. Uh, but again, Regular season Kirk Cousins is a lot different from playoff Kirk Cousins. Yeah. But the bottom line is he gets you there. Can he finally get that monkey off his back and get you a playoff win in Minnesota? Personally, I hope not because you know how, I, how I've got to listen to if they do get a playoff win. Marvin Gunn in the house. Oh, yes. yeah. So Yeah. I, well, I got – I mean, look, there's two teams I also would keep an eye on. I, I 
I don't know about New Orleans. I need to see it. Uh, but Derek Carr could could be you know a a, a change a game changer for them. I'm telling you, Atlanta, man. I am. They're they're the one I'm going to keep Atlanta. sticking with. Uh, Atlanta yeah. is dangerous. Yeah. They're going to be dangerous. They've got a great young back. Let's see how quickly he can acclimate himself to the NFL level. And I've said this time and time again, that team spent over two hundred million in bringing in defensive personnel to fix their defense. Is Ken Ritter rise to the case? It's just like New Orleans, it yeah. all revolves around a quarterback. Same thing in Atlanta. Can Ritter handle the task? Can Derek Carr fit in and make that machine flow? Because New Orleans has everything you need except the quarterback. The quarterback is a big question. Mm-hmm. But he went out and got a proven regular season quarterback. You know, Derek Carr is a monster in the regular season. Can he can he turn that team around and make them that team? That a few years ago, when Drew Brees was there, was a lethal, consistent playoff team every year. Uh, look, and, and yeah. from his standpoint, just like from a legacy standpoint, you got to think Carr wants to show everybody with the Raiders organization that absolutely you know, it wasn't necessarily me; it was you, right? I mean, absolutely. he's going to be on that kind of mission, I think. Absolutely. Uh, sure. I'll tell you the, the. I just, I don't know about Dennis Allen either as a head coach. Right, he, he might fall into that category as one of those guys who's a, who's a fine defensive coordinator, but you know we'll see. I don't see more than one team coming out of that division. I don't either. Uh, I don't either. Well, you know what? Come to think of it, you could have let's see three teams in the East again. Yeah. Um. Let's see. North is going to be. I I think it's two. I think it's the Vikings and the Lions in the North. So that's that's five. Right. I think uh out west Seattle and San Fran. That's seven. So yeah, one 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 out of the I think I think Atlanta and, and, and New Orleans are gonna be real interesting. Um because as bad as they were last year, both teams still won seven games. They were both yeah. seven and ten last year. Yeah. Um and all they both needed was a quarterback. You know, obviously, Marcus Mariota wasn't it, and he was no. in and out as a starter. They weren't sold on Ritter last year, but now it's his show. Mm-hmm. Now they're saying they have the utmost confidence in Ritter. They have everything you need down there. The big question mark is the quarterback. New Orleans the same way. They have everything you need on both sides of the ball. Can Derek Carr take that team back to what it was? That's a huge question, yeah. and, and we're going to see. I think those two teams – now, Carolina – I think Carolina is is not a playoff team, but I think Carolina, when you look at the pieces they've had, they're going to upset some people's apple carts. I really do believe that. They're going to win some games they're not supposed to win this year. Um, And the rookie, the quarterback situation is, is, you know, how soon do you put in Bryce Young? You know, how far uh, can Dalton take them? You know, I I think that's going to be huge. If anybody can get the most out of a quarterback is Frank Reich. Yeah. With this system. That's going to be huge. I, I don't see Carolina as their playoff team yet, but I do think they're going to be a very competitive team because their defense was pretty good last year. Defense I think, wasn't bad. You know, I think they are at the end of the year, Derek. I think they're one of those teams you say, oh, look out next year. Look out next year. Like Absolutely. They're, you saw strides, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But not quite there, but they're on the right path. I think that's what, what we're talking about with Carolina when the season's over. I mean, you, you have everything you need except – the quarterback. You have a great yeah. dual rushing attack. Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, Terrence Marshall, uh, LaVisca Chanel. You know, that's not a bad quartet of receivers. You got a great tight end in Hayden Hurst. Mm-hmm. So you have the weapons. Can the offensive line hold up and give and, and give the, whoever's quarterback in time to find those weapons? Yeah. Defensively, I love the personnel that they have on their defense. You know, I mean, you got J.C. Horn and Xavier Woods in the back end, Vaughn Bell. Um, you got Shaq Thompson you know, in, the, in, in the linebacking position. You got uh, Shy Tuttle on the D line. Uh, I, I like I like the personnel. I really do. But I'm can looking. they put it all together? Yeah, I hear you. Big all right, let's see. let's sneak one in. Uh, this could be fun. What we're doing on our NFL segment coming up in a little bit. Um, we're going to draft skill positions. So you and I are going to grab two quarterbacks, two running backs, two receivers, and two tight ends. And we'll play off of each other. And you get first pick. I'm giving you first overall pick. 
first overall pick? You get first overall pick. So we're going to do what that. Posi- okay, what, what position are we start? Quarterback with? will go first. Oh, we already know my answer. Okay. Well, all right, we'll do that. And there's a, there's yeah. some other odds and ends that we'll get into. Uh, when we come back, there is some uh, some NBA news, which we'll, uh, which we'll dig mm-hmm. into. And then we'll talk some Sixers and Nick Nurse, some of the things that he had to say in his, uh, his opening press conference uh, with the team. So we'll do that when we come back as well. Don't go anywhere. Derek Gunn, Rob Ellis, Sports Take, Jacob Sports, YouTube Network. Let's talk about Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group because – Finding the right person and, and someone that you uh, you find trustworthy with your finances is critical. You don't want to get burned on this one. Right? You work too hard to, to try and set yourself up and set your family up as the years go on. But I can tell you from personal experience that Jim is somebody that I trust as well as uh, Principal Financial Group. Whether it's retirement planning, 401k review, insurance review, you might have a small business, you're trying to set up your employee benefits. He can help you with that, but it's not just that. It's anything that you have questions about. Jim is phenomenal at answering them, breaking everything down. He's great at getting back to you whenever you reach out to him. I know personally, I've entrusted my IRA, my 401k rollovers with Jim, and I couldn't be any happier. You will be too. Give him a call, 610-996-4751, 610-996-4751, or you could email him, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, dot jim at principal.com that's murray dot jim at principal.com 